Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Outbreak Management Advisory Board. And I'd just like to start off by welcoming, welcoming everybody to the meeting, those taking part, and also those uh, that will be watching at home after the meeting has taken place. And um, the first thing I'd like to do, though, is to go through any apologies and welcome any substitutes uh, to the meeting. And I'll ask Tracy uh, to do that for us, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, we have apologies from Philip Allett, um, the Police and Crime Commissioner, and Simon Dennis is substituting. We have apologies from Lucy Brown at York Hospital, Ian Floyd at the Council, Councillor Kilbane and Councillor Douglas is substituting. Um, further apologies are from Phil Metton at the CCG, Mike Padram at the Independent Care Group and his sub bed proctor can no longer attend, um, Dr Sally Tyra at from the local medical committee and from Lisa Winwood at North Yorkshire Police and Lindsay Butterfield who's here to substitute. Great, thank you very much for that Tracy and as a welcome to all those sub substituting uh, and coming along to today's meeting. The first agenda item is any declarations of interest. So I'll just give a couple of seconds here in case any colleagues want to declare any interest in relation to items on the agenda um, but if I can't see any any real or virtual hands um, I'll say that we don't have any additional declarations to declare and move straight on to agenda item two um, and that's the minutes of the meeting that we held on the 24th of July so I'd just like to, to check in a couple of seconds that you're happy uh, to sign off the minutes of that meeting that was held on the 24th of July and again if there are no real or virtual hands that are raised um, I'll take that as consent uh, to sign off those minutes. So I'll just give another couple of seconds in case there are any issues. Uh, if not, I'll sign off after the meeting those minutes. So thank you very much for that. That takes us straight on to agenda item three, which is the regular presentation on the current situation with COVID-19 in York. And I'll ask Fiona to present this to us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I will share my screen um, just to present that data to you. So um, this is the situation, as you can see, it's the graph that I, I usually show to you. And um, you can see that our current rate at the moment is 22, two, sorry, 226.5 per 100,000 population. So what we're seeing is in, in this last week is 478 cases over the period of a week. So on average, around 60 to 70 new cases uh, in York residents on a weekly basis. Uh, so it is a lot of cases, but as you can see from the comparison with the region, uh, it's the lowest in the region and lower than we're seeing across England as a whole. Uh, so you can see that we have had cases have been sort of dropping over the summer months, but as you can see just from the very right hand side, we have in the last couple of weeks actually started to see our cases um, going back up again in York and that is a picture that we're seeing nationally as well. So just looking at where those cases are coming from, in the last seven days, the highest rates are in the 10 to 14 year olds, the five to nine year olds and uh, the uh, 15 to 19 year olds. So the red bars there are the actual numbers of cases uh, and the blue bars are the rates of cases. So that's where we are seeing the majority of our cases happening. We do look specifically at what's happening in the over 60 population. So as you can see, when we look at that again, we have lower rates in this group than in the region or England as a whole. And in a seven day period in that age group, we've had 49 cases. So it's about 10% of all of our cases in York are in the over 60s. We look also at what's happening with NHS 111 and people calling up seeking advice um, for COVID. Um, so we can see that the numbers using that service have remained fairly consistent, um, which suggests that we've got less people who are sort of unwell with COVID uh, and seeking that medical advice. So that's a kind of early indication of whether we're starting to see um, illness uh, in the population going up. So that remains 
seems reasonably um, positive there. And that's really consistent uh, as well in terms of what we're seeing in the hospital setting. Uh, so as of 24th of September, there were um, 37 people in general beds in York and three in ITU. And that has been fairly consistent for a number of weeks now. So we tend to have around about 40 people um, in average uh, in York Hospital. And then that obviously links through to what we're seeing in terms of deaths um, as well. So, um, we have seen really that that link between hospitalisation and deaths um, has really been severely weakened. So very few deaths now within our York residents. Um, when we look at the um, data in terms of what we're seeing for all deaths, uh, which is the blue line there, and what we would expect to see at this time of year, it is slightly higher than, than what we'd normally see at this time of year. And that does kind of fit with some of the narrative we're hearing from colleagues in the NHS um, who are saying, you know, some of those winter respiratory um, issues that they generally um, see later on in winter are happening a little bit earlier this year. So I think, you know, that's something that we're, we're quite aware of in terms of the pressure that the NHS is under at the moment. So I said before that children is where we're seeing the bulk of cases. So I wanted to look a little bit more um, in detail at what we're seeing, particularly in school age children at the moment and, and what we've seen since schools went back at the start of September. Um, so this really is, um, you can see what's ha been happening since the middle of June or the start of June in terms of primary, secondary and then university age children so uh, or adults, that's the 18 to 21 year olds who may or may not be in a university setting, um, but it just gives us some of the context behind what we think we're seeing as well. Um, so you can see really that um, cases were um, rising and they had uh, started to, to drop down uh, at the start of the summer. So you can see that was when term um, finished for, for most uh, school children in York. So the, the cases were actually sort of starting to drop before the end of term um, and continued on dropping through the summer. Now, most schools went back here um, at the start of September, and you can see actually that the cases in primary and secondary age children had started actually to rise before term started, um, but now are, are kind of considerably rising at, at a faster rate now. And there's a number of other things that, that kind of play into this as well. So what we had sort of mid-June here was, was when we started to have 18 year olds able to get the COVID vaccination. And so if you kind of look on an eight week period from mid-June, what we can see is that that's the period where a lot of 18 year olds have had their first dose and actually would have started in that period to get some of the early uh, vaccinated 18 year olds um, having their second dose of vaccine and what you can see in that grey line is after that point we actually started to see quite a dramatic decrease in, in 18 to 21 year olds who were testing positive um, for COVID. The downside of that is that a virus obviously needs a host uh, and that also coincide then with when we start to see more cases in the younger age groups who aren't yet vaccinated. Uh, of course, there's quite a few other things that come into the mix there as well. Um, so we know that uh, middle of July was when we got to step four of the roadmap. So there was quite a lot of relaxation of some of the COVID measures that are in place, which will have had an impact as well. And then probably the other most significant 
change in what happened in terms of COVID guidance was here, which was when the change to the isolation guidance happened. And, and for this age group, obviously the most significant part of that change being that um, if you're under 18 and a half and you've been a contact of a case, you don't have to isolate. So that inevitably kind of builds into the picture of, of what we're seeing. And um, so just kind of looking uh, in terms of what's happened in the first three weeks of schools returning in York, um, we can see that there are more cases in the secondary schools um, and these have been steadily rising over those three weeks. Uh, but the week on week rise in primary school age children is actually more striking. So we've had a tripling in cases in this age group um, from week one of school uh, through to week three of the school. So overall, the cases in primary and secondary schools account for almost a third of all cases that we have in the city. Um, and if you remember as well back to that chart that I showed of the five-year age bands, the next highest rates are in the 35 to 45 year groups, uh, many of whom um, will be parents of these children. Um, so on that, we do have uh, still probably the predominance of our transmission in the city uh, can be linked through to household transmission. Uh, so I, you know, often wonder whether, you know, what, what is it that happens in households? Is it the child getting COVID at school and then bringing that home and the rest of the family get it? Or, or does it work vice versa? Or, or is it, you know, the family have all been to an event and they all contract it at the same time? So one of the things we wanted to do was to just look at that in a bit more detail to see if we could sort of trace um, what happens where you have households, where you have multiple members of the, the household um, having COVID. And so this is uh, just a snapshot view um, of a two week period between the 10th and the 24th of September. Uh, and what you can see is you've got over 60% of cases in those households where there are multiple cases, um, over 60% where it was the child who acquired COVID first. So it does appear that that is sort of driving some of uh, the infection rate across the city. Um, so I'll just give you a, a quick update on our contact tracing service. Um, so you can see the blue bars are the proportion of positive cases that are contact traced um, and the orange is proportion that we have to uh, do a home visit uh, with. And um, so you can see that since we took over from the national contract tracing team, we've dramatically reduced the number of home visits um, that we need to do. So we have really good engagement from our residents in terms of picking up the phone and having that uh, conversation with the contact tracing team. We had a bit of a dip in um, the number of people that were able to be contacted over the summer months. Um, obviously, if people um, have COVID, they should be at home and, and isolating. Um, but so I'm not sure what we can read into that. Um, but but what we can see is over the last sort of few weeks since the end of August, beginning of September we're back up to you know over 90% of of cases being successfully contact traced uh, and this graph just shows the volume of cases that we deal with at a local level so there are always some cases that will be dealt with um, by the local health protection team so they're the kind of more complex cases uh, or people who are in hospital etc so uh, in the most recent week, um, 255 cases that the team were dealing with. And then finally, um, just to give you a bit of an update in terms of our symptom-free testing offer, what we're seeing at the moment and, and what our plans are moving forward. Um, so first of all, I just want to show you um, this graph, which is uh, numbers of lateral flow tests being done um, across all the groups and um, in York since we started this really back at the end of last year. It is a little bit difficult to see the colours so I'm just going to sort of show, show you a bit 
so this this pink line here um is all those who have a test at one of our um test sites and if you remember sort of back at the end of last year beginning of this year that was really the only way to get a lateral flow test if, if you wanted one so we can see that that was reasonably um, consistent. We had a, a lot of people coming through our test sites, but that's actually started to, to drop down quite considerably and, and you can barely see that line there. So it's we, we still do sort of within the sort of hundreds range of tests um, in our sites in, in over any week at the moment, but definitely dropped right off. And the main reason for that really is this purple line here that you can see and that is um that's the home testing route so earlier this year around april time it became a lot more easy for people to pick up test kits and do them at home they can be got through pharmacies and we also distribute them as well so one of the things that we've been trying to do is to get the message out around the availability of those tests and just get people really into the habit um, of doing regular testing at home and as you can see that's really sort Sort of grown um, uh, throughout the year and we have quite a high number of people registering their home testing kits and um, and then I'll just because it's quite hard to see this yellow line this is um, secondary school age children who are doing uh, lateral flow testing as part of their sort of uh, regular uh, activity in, in terms of going to school so we can see that we um, had, we've had sort of dips, um, particularly over the summer holidays here, and then the kind of returning back to school. We had a, an uptick there in in terms of um, students taking that advice to do lateral flow tests before going back to school. So in, in a period of a week, um, there's just over twenty three thousand lateral flow tests registered. I think the only thing to just mention on that is we know that there are probably more tests that people do at home but they just don't register them on on the government website so there probably is more testing activity um, that is going on and so this data really has in, informed our next steps and um, in terms of our testing offer for residents and um, so as i say initially we we had just our testing sites um, from last december and in that period, over those um, 10 months, we've done almost 50,000 tests um, on residents. From April, we moved to having more of an offer of uh, people being able to pick up test kits from our site. And we've been doing a lot of kind of educating with residents about, you know, how they do the test and getting them into that habit. And we've handed out over 13,000 boxes of um, test kits for people to take away um, and use at home. Um, and then um, the other piece that we've been doing is um, not just expecting people to come to us to get the kits, but doing some outreach work into communities where we've either had um, high rates of COVID uh, and actually doing door knocking and giving um, test kits out. And these are some of the areas that we have, have focused on since May. And we've handed out over 11,000 boxes of kits to people on the doorstep and had that conversation with them about the, the importance of, of testing. And I have to say that the team have had a really good reception um, to that work. It's been really well received by residents. So, so our kind of next offer um, going forward then from October really is that given that we just don't see the, the footfall into our testing sites and um, we will reduce those sites down to to have just three sites across York we do recognize that we have some people who um, need some help whether that's um, through a disability or you know not being digitally able and or you know various number of reasons so we still want to have a smaller offer for that in-person testing um, but we're really going to focus more on being able to have the community um, sites where people can come and pick up tests from us uh, and also continuing to do that outreach as well. So that's really um, the plan um, for the next three months. 
Um, so that's everything I wanted to share, but happy to answer any questions on that. Thank you very much for that, Fiona, and the presentation that you gave. And I know that the, the slides will be included and uploaded um, with the uh, minutes of the meeting as well. And um, so I'll open it up for any questions or comments that any uh, board members uh, would like to make other than obviously noting all of the, the continual hard work of, of, of public health teams and, and others across the, the health sector, which, which I know is uh, widely appreciated. So please do pass that, that back on, I'm sure, from the board. Fiona, I can see some, some nods. Um, Sharon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, I, I mean, I just wanted to um, highlight to the board really some concerns about the um, the evidence that Fiona shared with us uh, around household transmission, um, and and that you know the fact that we now know that over sixty percent um, of the um, cases um, in households are actually triggered by children. Um, even though we know that children, fortunately, tend to be um, not severely infected by COVID, obviously, if they're taking the infection home and, and it's spreading throughout the household, there is then a, a risk that that could get passed on to uh, family members who may be cl cl clinically vulnerable. Um, because of existing long-term conditions or, um, or indeed grandparents, um, elderly members of the community. So it, it, is, it is a concern. Um, and we're continually working with schools locally on how we can put in um, proportionate measures really to ensure that children are in school that they continue to um, access face-to-face -face education, um, but to try and minimize the spread of, of infection, um, which is a tricky balance to, to, to manage. Um, so I just wanted to highlight to the board those, those, um, those concerns really, um, and to say that we're working as far as uh, uh, as we can with schools within the um, national guidance um, to try and put um, measures in place to, to address that. Um, uh, but it's getting that balance right, really, between the, the, the need to ensure children are obviously able to access education. Thank you very much for that, uh, Sharon. Sharon. Um, actually, Sharon has just articulated one of the things that was bubbling away in my brain as I was listening to Fiona's presentation, which is, I heard from a friend of mine who I have to be very clear, doesn't live in York, um, but I understand. Unmute. <laughs> um, it's telling me I'm muted again. Can you hear me? I can hear you're, you. Yes. You're <laughs> not muted. No. It's very confusing. Okay. Um, so yeah i was having a conversation with a friend of mine um who doesn't live in york who's in another part of the country but they were saying that they have been told very clearly by their school that if they keep their child off school even if they believe their child has been exposed to an infection risk if there's no symptoms if there's no positive test they will be fined for not being in school and she was saying for her that's worrying but not as worrying as if you're living in a family with an immunocompromised individual or other people who might be clinically um, more at risk through this. And I was, I was wondering really about what approach our schools are taking on this, how we're balancing the human right to life with the human right to access education. So I really welcome Sharon's comment there. And I guess I'd be interested in understanding more about how we are, you know, what support can we put in place for, for, for pupils and for parents to enable everyone to be able to kind of get on with things as best as they can without putting people at extreme risk. Um, so I, I really, really value understanding a bit more about that. And I, I think Sharon's point was very well made. So, Thank you, Sharon. And um, conscious that Man Amanda's on the call as well. So I was going to bring Sharon or, and or Amanda back, back in on that point. I don't know who would, who would like to go first. Whoever comes off mute first, Amanda. <laughs> Shall I start? Um, yeah, I, th I think it, it's a, a really interesting point, Sean. We we have um, a really positive relationship with all of our schools across the cities as through the Schools and Academies Board. And 
and we take a very, um, I think, nuanced approach to the use of fines. You know, we it's very, very much a last resort for, for us and our schools. And, and we would have done absolutely everything to support people to attend school and access education in the most appropriate way before we got to that point. So the, the experience that, that you've had from, from other places, I would absolutely hope would not ever be an experience that, that anybody would have in York. And I, I would never anticipate that it would be. Thank you for that, Amanda. Sharon, I can see you nodding in anything you'd like to add. Um, I, I mean, I suppose it's just to draw the distinction between um, a, a parent who is keeping their child off school for um, a fear that isn't um, isn't borne out by the evidence. Um, and then a parent who has genuine concerns, either because there, there is um, COVID within the household or um, uh, there is a member of the household that is, um, you know, has significant health or um, uh, Im Im immune deficiency issues. Um, and so um, just to support what Amanda has said, schools do work very closely with um, you know Amanda's um, children's services and with public health, um, and it and where it's appropriate, we have worked through those individual cases um, to, um, to to handle them really sensitively, really. Um, so the only situation I can imagine um, where you might get into a fine is is if a parent was persistently keeping their child off um, without there being good reason to. Um, but as Amanda has said, I, I'm not aware of any case where a fine has actually been imposed. Thank you very much. James. <clears throat> yeah, so, so I speak as a parent who sat here with one child who's got COVID, 30-year-old lock, locked in the bedroom and uh, another who's, who's still at school, as it were. Uh, and, uh, and just really to flag up how, how confusing it was. So I kind of like to think I'm, I'm reasonably well gender up on what's going on. And, and my son tested positive over the weekend. Um, so obviously we took uh, the daughter to get PCR tested. Um, but pending that result, so we didn't know whether or not to send her to school on the Monday morning. Um, we, we, we phoned the school up and as it is, we, we decided collectively not to send her until the Tuesday till we'd got the result just to be sure we didn't get fined for that. But it, but it was really confusing when you read the guidelines and the letters that had come out from the schools and that was available, just what you're supposed to do. So there wasn't a risk of a fine. I don't necessarily think that the discussion is about the fine. I think it's just clarity of communication. So we know what to do if you've got more than one child. So, so she's now back in school because she tested negative. So that's all fine. But there was that interim period where one had tested positive. You're waiting for the results on the other. Uh, and it was just really, really, really unclear about what, what we're supposed to do. Jennifer, that's it. Amanda and, and Sharon, that's a conversation you could pick up with the Schools and Academies Board. I know it's one that you would, would already have had, but as best as the schools can, for, I mean, presumably the issue is the schools have the same national guidance that we do and do their do their best with it. But as, as much clarity as they can give, um, I think that's a really good example from James as to why. Uh, I can see Sharon and Amanda nodding, so we'll make sure that's an, an action point uh, from the meeting to take uh, forward. Um, so thank you all for those uh, questions and comments and, and to Fiona for that presentation and all of the ongoing work. Um, that then takes us forward to agenda item four, which is the vaccination and winter planning programmes. Um, and we've got Steph here uh, to present that. Um, so over to you, Steph. Yes, good evening. Um, we'll, we'll load our slide up, if I may, by the magic of somebody else pressing the button. And I'll take us through the, 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 the slides and then my colleagues, uh, Anita Dobson and, and Mike Holmes are here to answer any questions. Great stuff, thank you. So uh, this data is um, about four days old now, but it captures a weekend period. So if we move on to the next slide, um, as you know, we report as the Vale of York, which covers the city of York and our areas surrounding that, which part of North Yorkshire, so Selby, Tadcaster, Easingwold, Pickering, 
Um, and you can see that our overall picture is that, that we're edging up to 89% um, for, for first doses. Um, and as you would imagine, the second doses, which, which are eight weeks uh, following that are are, are progressing and, and increasing. So just to remind people that we um, started the programme and we prioritise uh, in, in order of the impact of the virus. So uh, vulnerable people, care homes, um, nursing settings, and then by age and, and health conditions that make them, them vulnerable. Um, and we'll, we'll, in the next slide, um, kind of busy but it but it, it I'd want you to think about the vaccination across the age bands and relate it back to the to the conversation that that we've just had around around the infection rates so um if we move on to the to the next slide please um I appreciate it's it's a bit busy and it uh, but if you if you if you go down to that bottom corner and think about the age bands um, everything sort of from 50 down to sort of 80 plus uh, 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 are, are in that uh, over 80, almost 90 percent and really high levels in our uh, over 80s. Um, uh, and I think that uh, for first and second doses, so we're, we're getting the maximum amount of protection from that primary vaccination and I'll come on to the doses uh, later but as we always say at this point um, no vaccine is 100% effective and uh, so it's really important that we are mindful of the other measures that underpin all uh, good infection control around hand washing um, and maintaining where appropriate uh, social distancing. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So if I just focus then on the York City uh, vaccination rates for, for, for COVID, we're at um, 83%. Um, and we previously talked about um, those levels uh, potentially reflecting um, quite a significant proportion of, of younger people in the city uh, and we we still we still maintain that um, so we are still running uh, our vaccination program for um, first and second doses so you can um, still book or you can still walk into one of the the, the, the centres that are running. Um, and I know we've been at uh, our universities and, and um, I did catch a tweet today which talked about um, the a grab a jab clinic at the university um, and its location where the clinic was being described as the uh, spaceship building by the lake and I think Charlie's got his uh, his background uh, perfectly illustrating that so it's just to continue to to reinforce that anybody can 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 take up their first jab um, uh, for for Covid so if we can move on to the next slide um that first uh uh picked pictorial representation shows the take up of the first dose jabs and you can see how it has tailed off in august and september and that's twofold one of course is that we're at sort of 82 83 percent averaging but in some cohorts uh, uh, over 95 percent um so we we are expecting now that our activity for our covid vaccinations for, for first and second doses which is what this um uh, graph shows to be low lower and a bit as you heard uh, Fiona explain, we're now starting to appraise how often we and the frequency of those clinics so we can get the balance between um, those people who want to access those, those, um, those offers and take up the offer of a COVID vaccine uh, with the, the, the resources that we require to put on those clinics. Um, so I, I think um, that, that that's a, a 
a, a, a reasonable um, picture that shows good take up of, of, of the vaccine in the early part of the program uh, and the activity is 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 slowing down now in in early um, as, as we start to get to much uh, smaller groups of people uh, accessing those services. So next slide, our focus now has started to move on to um, the third dose. So this is um, doses that, that, that add to uh, the primary dose of first and second. So we're we're often uh, hearing that described as a as a booster program. Um, it's not quite uh, that for everybody. Some people will have already received their third dose, might even be coming up to a fourth dose if their clinical condition uh, requires that. But we are now engaging with uh, those people who've had um, their primary uh, vaccination program for COVID and we are calling forward and have started to call forward uh, all those people who are post six months after their second dose. So as you would imagine uh, that of course is going to go in the same order as we started uh, first and second doses. So care home residents and staff, health and social care staff and, and our over 50s but that third dose program has already commenced. Um, so we continue to run that service through Nimbus at the York City and we also have um, an additional number of pharmacy suppliers as, as well. So again, uh, uh, next slide please. Um, anyone can, um, st can still get a first and second dose. It's, it's it's my theme. I keep keep reiterating that anybody who who wants one can can come and take first dose at any time. But we are now focusing on our third doses. Now we continue to have an eye on uh, why uh, and understand why people may not be taking up the the COVID vaccination. And this um, uh, uh, graphic shows the areas where we think there's low. Or lower take up um, and so it just helps us uh, sort of focus some of our efforts um, but as you've heard me say before there's there's always a balance between um, making uh, the offer accessible um, whilst balancing people's choice around uh, taking up the vaccine. May I have the next slide please? So again just to reiterate um, you don't need to be registered with a GP to take up a COVID vaccine. Uh, you can walk into any of our clinics and you'll be booked in there and then and offered a vaccination. And um, that, that will be the case with the, the, um, uh, the programme for, for pharmacies as well. Um, previously, you've asked me to uh, reflect and report on those wards that have lower take up. These are averages. We're, we're now sort of seeing um, all of our wards over 60%. And just to remind you around, uh, they are geographical take ups, but just to remind you again about the age profile that um, we've got really good take up of, of, our, of our age bands as well. Um, so, um, again, just reflecting on what we heard about uh, where transmission rates are coming from, um, you may be aware and have heard in, in the press that we are, we, uh, the, the, the global we, uh, the health and social care community, and, and, and now rolling out the universal offer to 12 to 15 year olds. Um, and that commenced this week in our area, uh, slightly earlier phasing in, in other areas, but the, um, the work's being uh, led by the school's immunisation teams um, and the approach is to offer uh, that vaccination to 12 to 15 year olds uh, before half term. Um, so that's happening. Um, on a previous slide, I talked about the really good uptake of 16, 17 year olds, particularly around the uh, work that our, our um, 
uh, clinicians had done to deliver those services in a variety of settings and 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 maybe um uh we'll touch upon that in the in the questions and answers can i have the next slide please so just pausing and moving on from covid um again we've referenced that we're starting to see uh more of our winter pressure viruses coming slightly earlier in the season so again just to remind people that uh we will start and have started the program for for flu all of our gps are signed up to deliver that along with our community pharmacy um and uh we've we've got that coverage across the whole of york um school vaccinations are planning to deliver an extended program to 15 year olds um and uh much like many employers um in the ccg will we've we've got um an offer for for our staff as well so we do have an opportunity to co-administer flu and covid at the same time in different arms um and i think we thought that at the point at which that guidance came on stream it would be something that would uh, happen sort of universally but but actually um we're very clear that one program shouldn't delay the other so we think the co-administration of flu and, and and the covid vaccination will be reasonably small in number and, and will focus on care homes residents and and eligible staff um for for, for flu and, and covid and the our uh, housebound cohort um so next slide just touches upon um those people who are in priority groups that can receive a free vaccination I'm not going to read all of that but it's just to reiterate that the flu vaccination program is is free for for certain groups and and um you will be contacted and and called forward to that next slide which is my final slide um so just to just um uh, uh uh, to reiterate that we have commenced and we're starting with the flu vaccination uh, program. Um, we've also got a, a, a lead uh, practice who are responsible for um, our uh, homeless group of, of people with well established links with uh, a range of um, voluntary sector providers. Um, really good uh, offer there uh, at the various things. Now, just to conclude, um, we have had some delivery issues with our flu suppliers, flu vaccination suppliers, I should say. Um, and it just sort of uh, gave us a stutter at the start of, of the programme. Um, my primary care colleagues who were required to cancel and then rebook thousands of appointments would perhaps describe it more than a stutter um, but we're, we're back on program around that and we have uh, been able to draw upon the support of our community nursing teams in previous years to offer additional support for particularly housebound patients um, but as you can imagine um, along with all of our uh, our care providers um, we we may struggle to to um, uh, bring that support forward as community nursing teams are focused on uh, other activity. So one of one of the things that I think this board is um, probably quite interested in is that we're also working on the revisions to the flu outbreak policy. Um, so that will be in place. Um, I guess if there's any questions about that between myself and Anita, we may be able to, to give you uh, some detail on that. But I just wanted to uh, assure the board that, that that's, um, that, that's been updated for, 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 um, for this coming uh, winter as well. So I'll, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Take the screen down. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Steph, for that presentation, which I know 
like Fiona's item will get added um, to the agenda pack and minutes when they're published. I just wondered, Mike and Anita, at this stage, um, whether there was anything in particular you wanted to add or whether you're happy to, to wait for questions. I'll check with Mike first. Um, no, I think I'm happy to uh, wait for questions, Keith. I think um, we, we, we can expand on any on the as any aspect that anyone would like us to. Thank you. And I think, Anita, you're, not, you're nodding in agreement with that. That's right. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you all. Uh, Councillor Douglas. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, it's just a, a couple of questions, really. Um, firstly, around deliveries of the flu vaccine into the city. Um, do you think that this is going to be a straight line trajectory now, or is it likely to be um, a, a, an unpredictable um, moving beast, I suppose. And then secondly, um, around the problem with community nursing and uh, support for house pound patients, how will those patients be um, vaccinated then if the community nursing team can't take on that capacity? Um, are there alternatives available? So, so Supply chain. Oh, Mike, are you, you've Mike's come off mute, so I'll defer to him. You might be um, bored with. Me. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the case. Then. I mean, I think. I mean, supply chain is. We don't know. Is the honest answer. I think there has been some. Um, there was challenges to begin with. They, they seem to have dates in the diary now for when we're expecting the next deliveries. But um, frankly, I guess anything could change at any time. We're getting reassurance, but, um, you know, and I think what we have seen is the adaptability of the teams. You know, it is it is frustrating to have to cancel and rebook clinics. Um, but, you know, um, the, the staff, the, the, all the practices and Nimbus Care are very um, prepared to do that if we have to. Um, and in terms of um, the community nursing, it, you know, I think we have to pay tribute to the community nurses who are working incredibly hard and, um, and and have been in communication with us about their challenges and and asked us to look at solutions and you know practices in 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 phases one and two of the COVID vaccination program practices were vaccinating their own housebound patients and of course the ability that we're prepared to do that again and the ability to co-administer vaccines um, does help here. Nimbus Care has offered to support that and we're liaising with Steph and colleagues in terms of how to do that. One of the advantages we might have to an individual practice doing it, of course, is um, you know, you may have um, people living on one street that are registered with four or five different practices. If Nimbus Care does it on behalf of all the practices, we can do it in a much more efficient way. Um, and, and, and um, you know, we're working very closely with them in order to set that up. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Sean. Not really a question. It was more to ask Mike um, if he could tell us a bit more about the... Um, pilot scheme around managing children with respiratory virus because I thought that was a really proactive example of how we are putting things in place in the system and I thought this was a good opportunity if anyone hasn't heard about it if they haven't read the press story to just make sure we're all aware so we can signpost people to it as well so I think that's a an important thing for us all to be aware of so um well I'm very happy to do that John I mean I think as you say this is this has arisen because we've seen a surge in uh, viral illnesses, particularly one type of virus, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. And we saw it a, about a couple of months ago, a huge surge, and it settled a little bit, um, but we're expecting it to rise again as we approach winter. And this affects um, young children under two-year-olds, and it causes bronchiolitis. Um, and what happens is, in the NICE guidance, there's three categories. There are patients that GPs would see and be very happy with and happy to send home. There are patients who we are very clear need hospital admission, but there's a group in the middle, so-called amber patients, that need a period of observation. So, and they've previously been going to the hospital or the emergency department for that observation. And actually, we can do that in a different way. So we've worked really closely with the CCG and with our pediatric colleagues. And we're using Ask and Bar for this, actually. We're using some of the facilities there to put on a, a trial for eight weeks of a, of a clinic that will enable us to assess and observe these children in the amber group with their parents obviously and um, it feels really collaborative um, it, it, the, the um, Nimbus Care and the Trust are funding this so I think that's a real um, uh, thing to be um, uh, proud of I think that, 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 that the, 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 the system is 
uh, are funding this, the providers are funding this, at least the pilot for it. Um, we start on Monday um, and we're, we're very excited to offer it. So it's going to be direct referral from GPs um, with the ability to observe children um, for up to two hours um, at Askenbar and hopefully prevent admissions wherever we can. Thank you very much for that and, and, and flagging the opportunity to, to highlight it again, which I agree is, is really important. Um, so thank you again um, to, to Steph, Mike and Anita for the presentation and all of the work which goes on, on behind it and obviously the questions uh, that we got as well. And um, that takes us on to agenda item five today, which is our communications um, update uh, and Gareth's going to present this to us. Yeah, if, if you could put the slides up, please. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so these are the um, these are the key messages which we've been pushing through the citywide city uh, partnership campaign, which I believe she, um, Claire showed board last time. Um, these continue to be the behaviours um, that, that we push because they're the key to stopping the spread um, and the impact of COVID. Um, just to note, we do understand from government insight that ventilation is a behaviour which is currently being overlooked. So we're, we're going to refresh these messages to reflect that as we move into the, like the colder weather uh, when people are more likely to gather indoors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example um, of the partnership campaign in action. So uh, the protect, respect, be kind messaging uh, applied by the University of York to fit their comm style. Um, and that's been used across campus now to send the, the tone for students upon their return. Next slide. It's just a yeah, reminder, we're, we're in phase four, safe and recover, if you can skip. And next one as well, thanks. I think you've seen that every month. Um, so on the roadmap, uh, we're whilst we've, uh, we haven't got any uh, changes to restrictions to communicate, um, there are um, many linked and ongoing campaigns, plenty to focus on, including uh, the relieving winter pressures on the health service. So Humber, Coast and Vale are coordinating that campaign. Um, and we're issuing a letter to every household, uh, the council's coordinating letters to every household in York, um, just to remind residents how they can reduce the spread of COVID and minimise pressure on the NHS over winter. That's, uh, that's supported and co-signed by the CCG and Hospital Trust uh, and should be distributed soon. Next slide, thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so this will just skip through some of our, our, um, our regular update work, if you can click that on. So this, this slide just really reflects the, the change in the news agenda around COVID. Um, we've just issued one uh, media release in last month directly COVID related. I mean, there are, there are some more associated items like um, additional support for businesses and grants for reopening and things like that. Um, and obviously this doesn't include the, the work Nimbus and partners are doing uh, the, the weekly round of, um, of comms to get that messaging out. Um, but it isn't just a case of the council stopping talking about COVID. Uh, if you look at the media inquiries, um, there's a really, really low number, only four out of 39 media inquiries that received were, were COVID related in the last month. So that the media aren't asking about it either. If you can just move us on. Um, so our regular communications are continuing. We've reduced the volume of some of those regular comms in terms of the briefings and the um, and the, the um, e-newsletters and things like that, um, just as our demand for business as usual communications returns to, to, to more normal levels. Uh, but we're well positioned to ramp them up again as and, as and when we need to, if there is a change in the circumstances or restrictions. Can we move on? Um, so just to recap, one of the most significant changes in the last month was the, um, was the back to school messages. Um, need to head off as much of the confusion and anxiety uh, about the beginning of the school year as we could. Um, this slide shows the channels we've used, including a letter to all parents and carers of secondary school pupils. Um, uh, as Fiona mentioned earlier, we, we are monitoring the school rates and we'll work with um, colleagues, schools and, and partners, of course, to, to support any response. Can we just move on? And these, yeah, these are the, um, the parts of the schools, uh, the resource pack that we, we provided for schools and academies and parents and students, uh, students um, which signposted um, some of the key behaviours um, using this collateral. They're all still there on the Let's Be York pages on our website if anybody wants to view them or use them. Um, the action point and the discussion earlier does suggest that we, we need to strengthen or at least 
revisit the guidance around isolation. So I'll pick that up with, with, with Amanda and Sharon. Next slide, please. Um, so 16 to 29 year olds, we've, we've supported the um, a very big national push on vaccinations for young people. Um, uh, I'll talk a bit more about the insight that informs the campaigns in a couple of slides. Uh, but the, these are some of the national resources we, we've shared with all schools, colleges and unis to distribute as well as, well as in our own um, corporate comms uh, and social accounts. Um, and that, again, that, that complements the ongoing weekly media rounds communications from, from Nimbus um, and the CCG to, to promote the pop-up clinics. Next slide. So there was a question at the last board around um, social media and approaches um, for younger people. So I, what, what I've done in, in the last month is I've just been speaking to all the other agencies who are running campaigns um, just around uh, their insight, the messaging and the platforms they're using. Um, and so th this this slide and what I'm about to give you now is, is a combination of feedback from the Cabinet Office, NH England, NHS England and, and Nimbus. Um, in terms of motivations for, for, for this age range, um, the or be health, the, the best the, the factors for behaviour change and to encourage people to um, get a vaccine at this age range is the the, the key um, is to remove those barriers, just to make it a lot much easier to participate. Um, so convenience is a massive factor. Um, the NHS has been very much on um, young people's turf in the in, in the last few months. So they've had pop-ups at music festivals, they've had a, a presence on in unis and colleges, and and a big campaign for, for any um, colleges that haven't had um, on-site uh, pop-up vaccinations. They've they've been signposting to where the nearest ones are. Um, in terms of motivation, the the, the insight tells us younger age groups still have a, a, a lower, very low sense of personal risk. So the two most effective prompts for, for young people uh, to, to get vaccinated are doing the right thing, doing something for the social good, and um, and as you saw on the assets earlier um, shared, it, it said um, it was about uh, getting back to normal, so doing things, um, doing normal things again sooner. That that sort of messaging. The messenger is very, very important. Um, partnerships have got a really strong role to play. They've been very effective for us locally. Um, the NHS has got some really strong touch points um, for this age range nationally. Um, they've been distributing a lot of information through driving instructors, the National Council of Driving Instructors, obviously a lot of 17 year olds in that market um, and oh, in their custom base, I should say. Um, and they've also been working with um, 10 of the 10 employers with really large number of 16, really large portion of um, 16 to 18 year old staff so they've worked with um, retailers like next hilton hotels weatherspoons um born leisure who run the holiday camps with lots of young seasonal staff um and they've been getting resources shared through their internal communication channels and they've they've organized um sort of live q a's with doctors shared videos and other resources through them um to answer the question about social media, because that was the question, wasn't it? Um, the Cabinet Office and uh, Public Health England have got partnerships with TikTok and Snapchat. So they're using those to encourage influencers to, to demonstrate and promote their own vaccine journey. Um, there's a, one example is Dr. Amika, who's a, a medical doctor and, and a TV personality who's got 80,000 um, TikTok followers. It, it's people like them who are... Who are we were there to um, answer questions around it and offer reassurance, but then it's also about encouraging peers to share their stories. So um, not just those recognised influencers, but, but people within communities. People need to see people like them acting just so that that, that sort of normalises vaccination in that age range, in that age group. Um, the slide shows a few examples of, of that in action locally. It's the um, Nimbus sharing sharing a few uh, personal stories that the, the wire had mine stories that you can capture um, at vaccine clinics um i just want to mention briefly as well that, that this um there's a regional trial being commissioned by public health england uh, which is working with local authorities across the region across yorkshire and their objectives are to the objective of the campaign is to, to uh, decreased transmission, um, so focusing on self-isolation practice in particular, and increasing the uptake of the vaccine in areas where, where it's at its lowest. Um, the Behaviour Change Agency that's running the campaign, they've, they've um, 
they crunched all their data and got a lot of insight and concluded the national campaigns are, are working well, but in areas of lowest take up, um, the, the primary focus needs to be about simple, um, clear information. So the campaign will be called COVID Explained, and it's just going to be about clear and concise messaging about where to get your vaccines and where and when to isolate, what isolation means, why to do it. Um, they're starting with two pilots in the areas of lowest take up. Now you've seen our stats, you won't, won't be surprised that, that that's not York. Um, there's pilots in, in um, areas of Leeds and Grimsby that they're starting with, but they do promise there will be a regional campaign to roll out based on the results of that pilots and that learning. So we should get the campaign assets um, to use by um, mid to late October. Um, and it's likely to be a combination of um, social media assets which which they would expect and and would want to be shared by institutions and partners so very much reflecting reflecting the york approach uh, and uh, network marketing so finding those um community influencers who can um who can share the assets and have got a credible voice within their communities um, and then backed up by paid for Instagram and, and Facebook advertising. Interestingly, they're not looking at TikTok for this campaign as the um, target audience for them, their insight saying it is 20s and up uh, in the areas where, where it's at its lowest, where, where, where they've, um, they've dived into the data. Um, but as we get more of the insight and the campaign materials and we're able to show, um, we're able to see what lessons are to learn from it for York and how, how we can apply it to our communities, then we'll share that with with partners uh, and, and the board. Can I have the next slide? So as discussed earlier around the um, the rollout of vaccines for 12 to 15 year olds, we, we've got the national assets, which we'll be using uh, and we're primed for the York rollout uh, to support the school's immunization service. And final slide. Oh no, it's not the final slide, is it? An ultimate, I think. Um, we still continue to share the, the, the grab a jab resources. Um, as was said earlier, you can still get your first and second jabs, we're reinforcing that. We've been providing shareable information, shareable, uh, collateral at sites for people to, to, to give their friends and family after they've had their, theirs. Um, and uh, Nimbus are introduced in selfie boards uh, to increase digital sharing to, to, to influence peers as well quite soon. Um, we produce a weekly, um, or we produce a weekly hard copy leaflet and, and distribute information weekly digitally. Um, it just lists where vaccine clinics are, who they're for, um, and uh, we distribute those with, um, with, with, with testing kits um, and, and the door-to-door -door work that, um, that Fiona was, was mentioning earlier. Um, and as Fiona also said earlier, we're, we're still promoting testing. So plenty of communications promoting the regular home testing and signposting to the sites where the assisted lateral flow testing is available. Um, next slide, please. And just to reference um, these, these two campaigns, um, uh, supporting people to to, to um, with both um, physical well-being and uh, emotional well-being. So the what's my next step campaign is a, a campaign about um, getting people moving again, uh, getting active again. Uh, people who may not have um, been out and about as much as they they might have been over the last eighteen months. Um, we've um, and feel real York is support emotional well-being. So on here we've got um, just some more activity this month. We've had uh, the um, Olympic, a former Olympic rower, GB Olympic member of the GB Olympic rowing team, getting uh, its providers a great case study, secured a lot of local broadcast and um, some national media retention. And the emotional well being campaign that the Phil of York has been focusing on suicide prevention this month. So, tied to World Suicide Prevention Day, which was on the 10th of September. Um, and we've released a toolkit for, for partners, mainly uh, mainly using Humber Coast and Vale's resources. Um, so thanks to them, which have um, uh, partners have been sharing across their intranets, newsletters, uh, social, and across across wider networks. And that's it. Thank you very much, Gareth, for the presentation. And again. Like like earlier, all the work that, that goes in but behind it and these on on ongoing. Uh, Sharon. Yes, thank you, um, Gareth, for that and for the work of the team, um, which has been fantastic throughout the whole of the pandemic. Um, I just wanted to raise um 
two issues that I think for the board's uh, attention. Um, one is that we know that there is an increasing level of complacency um, around COVID and, um, you know, the, the desire for everyone um, to get back to normal and do normal things is really understandable. Um, but we need people to do those normal things safely. Um, and, and it's clear that there's quite a lot of complacency that, 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 that is now out there and um, it, it, it's it's increasingly challenging to get some of those messages to land in in the right way and then the other issue which we touched on earlier in the meeting is um as we go into winter we're not just concerned about covid um we're also concerned about flu and we're concerned about other um uh, other respiratory viruses and um norovirus um which will have an enormous impact on our health and social care system so um, the next phase of our communications need to kind of focus on infection prevention and control messages and the simple steps that people can take to keep themselves well. And that really has got to be ab uh, about vaccination, that is key, but also hand washing continues to be important. Um, practical messages around ventilation, particularly as we head into the winter, people aren't going to want to be sitting with their windows open. So what are the practical uh, steps we can um, uh, take um, to improve ventilation? But the other um, area I wanted to touch on briefly was um, the wearing of face masks. There is increasing evidence now, um, including a study published um, just this month um, on a randomized control trial of the positive impact that the wearing of face masks can have in communities. Um, and so um, I wanted really a steer from board members as to whether we wanted to go further than the government um, advice. Um, and start really promoting um, uh, the wearing of face masks as being a really important measure to help prevent the spread, not just of COVID, but those other winter viruses. Um, the government, as we know, have left it up to personal um, uh, uh, behaviours around this. We're not in a position to mandate the wearing of face masks. Um, it still has to be a personal choice, but it's whether we feel given this recent evidence that we need to go further in recommending um, the wearing of um, face masks. Um, and um, I think um, Gareth mentioned briefly uh, a letter that is being prepared that will go out to all households, um, uh, from myself as Director of Public Health, um, from the GP clinical chair um, of um, the, clin you know, the Vale of York CCG and the medical director of the hospital. Um, and if we have a steer from the board as to whether you think we can go stronger on the wearing of face masks message. And then we have an opportunity in, in, in that letter that will be landing on everyone's doorstep in, in, in York to, to promote that. And um, so I'd be keen um, chair to get views from the board on that. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I was going to make a, a separate point, but, uh, you know, uh, Sharon, I would, you know, as a, as a clinical voice would absolutely endorse that that um, um, suggestion. So, um, yeah, I, I can't say any more to that, but I, I would certainly endorse it and I can certainly see nods around the, around the board here. Um, the point I was going to make, if I can now, Keith, that was just about um, uh, flu vaccinations in the 50 to 64 year old age group. So last year was the first time ever that that age group was was um, able to get a free flu vaccination. For a variety of reasons, it was delayed quite late in the season into December. Um, and the uptake in that age group was quite low, it was nationally around 
35%. We're aiming for something much higher this year in the region of 75%. So Gareth, I, I don't know, you know, it comes around that and just encouraging those 50 to 64 year olds to, to go for their flu vaccine. I think um, if we could think about that, I think that would be really, really helpful. Obviously we'll be doing something from Nimbus Care, but um, a, a concerted citywide effort would be much appreciated. Gareth, did you, I'm sure you agree. Sorry, yeah, I thought I'd, uh, yes, yeah, and we, um, yeah, we go our week weekly, uh, meet weekly with um, with uh, colleagues from Nimbus um, NimbusCon, so we'll we'll put a plan together on it. That's great. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you, Keith. Um, picking up on Sharon's point about um, strengthening messages on face coverings, it's it's one of the things that I'm really emphasising strongly to uh, students. Uh, and, and frankly, it's a bit difficult because they see so many settings in which face masks are not being worn. Um, and that makes my job harder in, in uh, encouraging their use uh, within, um, in particular, teaching uh, settings at, at university. And uh, if, if we can have a, a, a very clear and very strong citywide message, it would really help what we are trying to do in universities. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, just the same message I want to come in in support of what Sharon was saying. I have been concerned for some time that it feels like we live in parallel universes where in my day to day life, fewer and fewer people are wearing masks, fewer people are using hand sanitizer, fewer people are worried about COVID. And yet I come to meetings with fellow health and care professionals talking about their fears for what's coming, the winter planning, systems under stress, staff burnout. And it feels like those two worlds will collide at some point. I'd like us to be able to put positive messages in to mean that that collision isn't a massive crisis for us all. I think it is that stage that we're at now that people need to understand that our system's under pressure and everything they do that helps us alleviate that pressure gives us a chance of making it through winter well, rather than badly. I think we do need to be really strong on that. And I have been worried for some time. It doesn't feel like that message is getting through. I think we need to be quite strong on it. So I would fully support that, Sharon. Thank you very much for that. James. Um, I suppose the question is, to what extent are we engaging the, the business community to actually support this message? So I think there's a danger when the message if you like, just comes from the health side of things all the time, that after a while it might get ignored a little bit, and it would be a much stronger message if we ensure that the economy side as well were saying the same thing. Now, obviously, uh, when you're talking about this, they'll, they'll, they'll be looking at the impact on their business, but if, if we engage the Chamber and the FSB and some of these key bodies to try and get their members behind it as well, so it becomes a consistent message across all partners uh, and not just getting preached at from the health people all the time. Thanks for that, James, as well. And I can see that Sharon's indicated to, to come back. I think it would be a good one, Sharon, uh, to have a conversation outside of the, the board. And I think, as James said, to get across as strong as possible a message from, from health colleagues, but one that is aware of the realities of what people are doing, government guidance, and, and, and what businesses are facing at the moment to make sure it, it does actually have effect rather than it being a, a, against the direction of travel of, of that government guidance, which is going to be quite a tricky balancing act. But I'm sure a few colleagues could get their, their heads together outside of this meeting. And, and I agree with James, getting that um, co-signed uh, from a business perspective, if that's possible, would, would be great. Sharon? Yeah. Yeah, very happy to do that. And um, we started this conversation within the public health team uh, earlier this week um, about the need to pick up again, James. We've had really close working with the business sector um, that has um, tailed off as we've got into stage four of the roadmap and we need to strengthen um, those communications. Um, I think I wanted to test the temperature of, of this meeting and, and, and whether board members would be supportive, but absolutely yes, and any support, um, you know, you and the LEP can do um, around that will, will, be, will, will be very welcome. Thank you very much for that. Um, so with, with that, and obviously noting the, the communications uh, update, that moves us on now to agenda item six, um, which is looking at the community approach to recovery. 
uh, and Moira is going to be joining us. So welcome and over to you. Thank you. And if the slides wizard could actually take me to the third slide, I think we could start there. Thank you. Um, so really an update from where we were last time, if you like, the last time I came to see the board, I think at that point uh, we had plans to finish our emergency response hubs as they were. I, I, I don't, sorry to, sorry to butt in, there's a, there's a lot of feedback. I don't know if you're a bit too close to your microphone. I apologise, I'll try no. again. Or, or it might just be the way that it is, but just, just in case, thanks. Okay, how does that sound now? Uh, it, I'm, I'm doesn't still sound good. Yeah, I'm not sure what I can do apart from maybe try to go out and come back in, Keith. Oh, I don't know whether you've got a headset you could plug in that might help. No, <laughs> I'm afraid that that, uh, that was broken, which is why I'm in this thing. <laughs> Um, I, it, it is quite bad when you talk. Um, I don't, I, I'm just trying to think because I know this was done with Alison and, and, and others, um, whether there was another way around the presentation. If, if, if not, try again. But I think if you speak really softly and, and just be aware of where the microphone is, that might help. Right. Could we could perhaps uh, dial, dial you into the meeting via your phone, uh, more if that's easier. I'm conscious of time as well. Yeah, me too. I don't want to waste your time. We're trying to get. It was working so well earlier. <laughs> so should should I try and leave the meeting and dial back in? I'll do that, and then I'm not holding up the agenda. That's that's okay. Let we'll we'll swap the agenda items around and try that. And um, thank you very much. And um, least you can tell, we're all doing it, uh, not live streamed on this occasion, but it will be uh, put, put, put up there and see it there. When Moira comes back, if we get the same, um, what I might be inclined to do is to defer the item to the next outbreak management board. So we give it obviously the, the attention and, and, and conversation that it deserves, but we'll see when Moira com com comes back into the meeting. Um, that then takes us on to uh, agenda item seven, um, and then I'll come back to the, the last one in a little bit of time. So agenda item seven is the third impact survey. So it's an update from the voluntary sector, um, which Alison is here to lead and present. If you don't mind jump, jumping up, that would be great, Alison. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here. Hopefully, you, I'm coming through Perfect. loud and clear. Hooray. <laughs> Um, okay, so Joe, can you go to um, the key findings part of the slide set, please? So I'm not going to go through all the slides, you'll be pleased to hear. I'm just going to summarise some of the key findings. So this was the third survey that we've uh, carried out during COVID. So we had two last year and this one was uh, this summer. Um, and things are looking better than they were, although we can't be complacent because we've still got lots of challenges, but it's not as doom and gloom um, as it was before when we had quite a few charities potentially facing closure. So, so one of the key things uh, you'll see from the slide is 87% um, of organisations reported a decrease in earned income. So charities are funded through lots of different ways. So it might be through grant funding, contracts, raising funds from uh, community fundraising events or trading. So for example, at York CBS, we have our conference centre. So that's our trading bit and that generates quite a bit of income for us. Um, so people might have charity shops, for example, or just sell training or domiciliary care services. So, so that was absolutely hit during COVID. So we would always say to charities, you know, have a very diverse spread of your income. And those that did came out worst because if you just had grant funding, you tended to be OK. But if you were actually quite proactive in uh, sustaining your charity, you really took a hit. So uh, so many of us, you know, we had no income in our conference centre, for example. That's quite a big hit for a charity like ours, and, and that's across the board in the sector. So the other thing to note is that 64% um, of organisations reported an increase in demand. So as we can see pressures on the entire health and social care system, that eventually finds its way down to the voluntary and community sector. So we are seeing waiting lists the same as everybody else now, um, as the pressure comes to us. 
but this is at a time when we've got um, fewer staff. So 39% said they had fewer staff. So many of us had to lose staff, make people redundant or just not recruit. So we've got much less staff and we're now struggling to recruit because we've got the same crisis as everybody else when it comes to recruitment. Um, and I think even more worrying is a 40% reported a decrease in volunteers, which is, is, is a lot for a, a York system. Now, luckily, we now have a volunteer centre that, thanks to funding initially from uh, the lottery, the community fund gave us some funding during um, COVID, and that's now been picked up by the City of York Council and North Yorkshire Police. Thank you. That means we now have a volunteer centre so we can help to sort of try and replace those volunteers that have been lost. The challenge for that is funding is only until March next year, and then we have to try and find some more funding so we don't lose the volunteer centre. So it's the constant ongoing challenge of, of short term funding. So another worry of mine is about depleting reserves. So um, a third of organisations have used their reserves and reserves are really difficult to build up in, in charities these days. You know, if you don't spend the money from a grant, for example, you give it back. You can't keep it like in the olden days. So it's quite difficult to, to build up reserves. So once you start using them, it can be a slippery slope. Uh, and we're seeing a, quite a few are using all of their reserves, which means there's only one way they're going to go. And that's down the pan, quite frankly. So we don't want to see organisations using reserves too much. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Joe? So uh, you won't be surprised to hear about digital exclusion, but perhaps what you might be surprised about is that 21% have found it an issue for staff. So in the voluntary sector, we're not great at IT. Um, you know, we're a bit behind the times in, in some ways. So that's an issue for paid staff, as well as for uh, volunteers. And a lot of the volunteers might be older volunteers, for example, who haven't really embraced the new technology and the new ways of working. Um, and 64% say it's an issue for service users, which won't be a surprise. Now we have got work happening through the Digital York, um, which some of you will be involved with. So hopefully that will help us find some solutions. Um, there were positive um, outcomes. You know, we've all looked at doing things differently. We're now looking at doing things uh, in a more hybrid way. So running events face-to-face -face, um, and by Zoom at the same time, if technology permits it. So we're looking at being much more creative in the sector and, and some services have moved online and that's working quite well for some people, but clearly it's not the answer for everyone. Can we move on to the um, financial sustainability, please, Joe? Let's stop. There we are. OK, so this is what I was referring to. So previously we were seeing many charities only thinking they would survive beyond three to six months. Um, it's looking much more positive now, although we've had a couple of closures. Um, it's not a disaster at the moment. So we've got 76% um, thinking they'll be OK for at least 12 months. So that's a much brighter picture. Um, but obviously we have got some who are still not out of the woods. So we um, have an event tomorrow. We have a, a voluntary sector forum where we're going to be going through lots of surveys, including this one, um, and asking the sector um, recommendations for York CBS, uh, for the public sector, perhaps the business sector as well, um, and also the voluntary sector to see what can we do to ensure the sustainability of the sector. So I would ask you to think the same, you know, what do you think your organisations can do to support the sector? Because we know there's more and more emphasis and re uh, reliance on the sector than ever before now, because the public sector cannot cope with all the challenges that we have. So. We're not asking for handouts, we're asking for people to think about how can you invest in us early on as you start to plan uh, new services, for example, looking at diabetes. So we're looking at how we can position the sector so we are part of the early conversations and money flows through to the sector in that way. So I'll leave it there. Any questions? Thank you very much for that, Alison, and, the, and for the slides. Um, any questions? or comments to Alison. I think the key one there, Alison, was really the request that, that all of our organisations reflect on what they can do to, to help the, the, the voluntary and, and community sector. So it might be one of those ones where there isn't an immediate um, answer at this stage, but more one to reflect on and that we'll be able to come back to you in conversation or to, to future meetings. And um, with the slides and the data, um, will that be able to be published with the notes of this meeting if it hasn't already been? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. And, and I'll come back perhaps with recommendations from the meeting tomorrow at a future meeting or circulate them. So if there's anything we think you can help with, we can share that with you. 
yes, please, that would be great. Um, Councillor Douglas. Thank you, uh, Chair. I, I just um, would like to echo what Alison has just said and I suppose clarify perhaps slightly um, that essentially all of our services, I think, sat here to some extent um, or great extent signpost people to other services and nowadays that is to the voluntary sector but the voluntary sector isn't brought in in early discussions about how they're going to cope with that volume of um, of service users and I can think particularly around mental health at the moment this is um, really being pushed into the voluntary sector and uh, the voluntary sector hasn't had the opportunity to plan for that um, nor has it necessarily had the partnership backing in order to apply for large grants to bring in the staff to support those referrals. So I, I think that really is hugely important that everybody here thinks how we can prepare the voluntary sector for the work that they are going to be increasingly expected to do. That This isn't going, it's only going in one direction, isn't it? I think we all know that. Thank you very much for that. Um, so no, noting the, the presentation and, and obviously that request that, that I know we'll all, we'll all consider, um, I will now go uh, back um, and, and see if leaving and coming back has, has helped more. If not, what, what we said more is that what I would do is defer the item to the next board meeting just to make sure we gave it full uh, consideration. But we'll... Uh, whether you want to try talking to us now and we'll see. Testing, testing. How's ah, that? It's working. Is that better? Brilliant. Let's <laughs> go. You. Let's go. So if we pop to my third slide again, and I'll try and keep it potted. And if there's any other detail that you want following this, I'll, I'll, I'll add, add, add to it. So uh, last time I came along to the way to the board, what I was saying to you is that uh, we thought we were winding up our emergency response hubs at the end of July, but we brought a few options that were being explored. And the one that was taken forward uh, was working with our colleagues in public health around the uh, lateral flow collection points in the community and the community outreach. So we're working in tandem with them. And that has allowed us to keep um, the sort of home fires of the emergency response burning behind the scenes and still been there to pick up anybody who has needed basic support around uh, shopping prescriptions what have you because of self-isolating uh, because of a positive test or or being a close contact so that's meant a really positive move that we could keep that going and support that outreach um, we've been able to support that uh, outreach with the use of, of staff a mixture of existing staff temporary staff and volunteers together and being supported by a lot of the community um, activity that's already out there that we've been linked in through the pandemic so it's meant there's been a really good network um, to be able to deliver on that uh, lateral flow which which was the, 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 the most recent uh, addition, if you like. Um, since the start of the pandemic there, we've got the tasks that we've been undertaking really basic. I mean, at the, the height of lockdowns and things, we were, we were making out of the hubs hundreds of calls a day. Um, at the moment, our, we're making probably 30 from across the hubs, out of the hubs. Um, Long-term support, we've really uh, tried to move people on and find local solutions for people. So we haven't created dependencies where there weren't before, tried to find uh, and support people for as long as they needed, whether that was um, support and confidence to, to get out and about again. Over the summer, since we continued our, our activities in the hubs, um, we started coffee mornings and socially distance or COVID safe uh, engagement events, which did support that getting out of the house for the first time, um, confidence to go to the shop for the first time, that sort of thing. And just engaging with another human being, reflecting on the conversations about um, sort of mental health and, and well-being across across the piece. So that, that that's what's new, if you like. Um, so we're still continuing what we're doing. We're, we're still getting some referrals through uh, from those classified as clinically extremely vulnerable, although obviously the, the shielding list is going to, going to stop. Um, probably about 30 a week coming through to the hubs, just so that you've got that, that information. Um, 
Uh, next slide, please. When I was, was thinking about bringing these slides together, it's, it's almost more of the same, I, 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 I gather, but I just wanted to give you a little flavour of difference of what the difference it has made to the various people that we've been engaging with or those that have been involved as volunteers and staff, because I think that's crucial when you think about the sort of societal change and the, the impact that it's having on people. So these are just really uh, uh, random examples that I picked. And when I picked this one, which was from somebody that we supported to get their shopping and volunteers, uh, so shopping and prescriptions and things, and we spoke to over the phone over, over several months, um, I thought, oh, I've made a mistake here. I found an example that said, all the volunteers have been very kind and friendly. What about the staff? And I thought, actually, that's brilliant because it just means that they just see everybody as, as being helpful and part of that movement. It doesn't matter whether you're classified as a volunteer or a member of staff or anything else. And I thought that was a really nice touch actually when I, when I picked up this example. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of quotes from the volunteers as well. And I think just picking up the difference it's made for them. You know, it's really important for a lot of people to feel like they can do something proactive and constructive during, during such a crisis or such a, a challenging times, if you like. And I particularly picked up on these two because it shows how it's helped people to feel useful, but also um, given them a greater understanding of their local area and some of the challenges. And I think that's, that's really important. Next slide, please. And, and this one was for a member of staff. And I think the bit on this one, I'll, I'll leave people to read it themselves. I won't, I won't you know, read with mother, but it's the last bit that really struck me. The, the quote that I now make sure I chat with anyone I come across if they seem that they want to, whether at work or at home. And I thought that was a, a really significant change or just a significant point to pick up on. Next slide, please. So I suppose picking up on some of the things that, that we've heard through the other presentations, there's, there's much more um, collaboration, I think. There's a lot more interest in working at a very um, grassroots level and opportunities to either co-locate or to, to work together in areas. Um, sorry. <laughs> I think I've thrown myself with, with not knowing whether I was uh, being able to speak or not. So lots of conversations going on, especially around health, about well-being, about financial inclusion, about volunteering, about, and there's a really strong message about modeling the sort of behaviors and interactions, picking up on that last point about staff, about us, us, us showing that we can work closely together. I think a really nice example of, uh, a lot of the staff that within the communities team that I manage have been involved with the whole process. They have been involved with, um, so they've upskilled around having conversations about vaccine hesitancy, having conversations, you know, where to sign post people for support, um, having conversations, real basic conversations about financial inclusion, that sort of thing. And they're taking that into their everyday work where they are now and into a lot of other community settings, which is, I think, a real bonus. And also a lot of the volunteers that have worked with us are doing similar. And I'm sure that's a lot of uh, similar for a lot of the volunteers that have worked um, through the initiatives with, with CVS, where they're, they're cascading a lot of that information out. So I think that links very clearly back to the messages that um, Gareth was, was expanding there. And that's a real opportunity for that trusted word of mouth way of getting information and messages out it goes back to the conversation about masks and, and the basics about hand washing and that sort of thing we can still get out there so next steps for us are still about rolling out that community hub approach but I suppose the key message for us here is we're still here we can still get messages out we've still got opportunities um, to link into initiatives should should that be needed and we can dial up um, as, re as requested um, and we can offer other people opportunities to come in and join with us in the community hubs across the city. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm really pleased um, that it all went well this time. And um, just to open it up for any uh, questions or comments and, and similarly, more just to pass on all our thanks um, to the teams for, for all of their work. Um, that that did go on and is continuing to to go on with that with that uh, project.
Thank and you. so I'll just give it a couple of seconds in case there are any questions. Um, if not, thank you very much for that. And then we'll now uh, move on um, to the next agenda item, which is agenda item eight, update from the universities and higher education subgroup. Uh, there's a paper that's been published uh, with the agenda pack and over to Charlie. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, it's all go. Um, the colleges have been up and running for some time uh, and uh, last weekend was the arrivals weekend for new first year undergraduates at both University of York and York St John. We're now uh, in, in Freshers Week and uh, we head into uh, the full swing of teaching uh, for all students next week. Uh, with all that, we've got about 40,000 students um, in the city at study uh, in a pandemic, uh, which is um, a, a challenge and which brings uh, risks. Uh, we've been thinking about that hard um, as, as a group and with the uh, public health team at the City Council. Uh, we all have outbreak management plans which have been agreed uh, with the public health team. Uh, we've tested them in desktop exercises to think through the scenarios that might befall us. Uh, and uh, we're also thinking, of course, about uh, Plan B, if we should ever move to the government's Plan B. Um, and indeed, um, we have um, uh, uh, scenario plans in our digital cupboards for um, the more extreme versions that could uh, involve lockdowns. Um, so that's all thinking about the future. Currently, we are mitigating risks in various ways. I have to say the, the citywide communications campaign is great. It does allow us to, to produce a consistency of message, and I've been really pushing that this week uh, in, a, in a whole range of student uh, welcome events. Uh, we're using that to frame our um, uh, on-campus uh, and, and general mitigations uh, they are vaccination, obviously, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, testing, uh, very much encouraging that twice weekly uh, testing regime. Uh, self isolations, if positive, um, we uh, are maintaining support for students who have to self isolate through uh, digital vouchers for food and um, uh, entertainments and other things. Uh, we are pushing a very strong message on face coverings, um, so I was very pleased to hear what Sharon was saying about that earlier. We have the usual hygiene um, precautions and we're thinking hard about ventilation of, of uh, rooms which will have a lot of people in them. Um, the thing that really puts us into a different situation than in the past, though, is vaccination. Uh, it was very interesting to hear from Steph earlier, the, the vaccination rates generally in, in the city and in the CCG area and in the um, 18 to 29 age group, which I think was singled out. Uh, we are way ahead of uh, those rates in the student population, way ahead. Um, first vaccination rate for students is above the first vaccination rate for the city of York as a whole. It's 91%. Uh, at the University of York. Uh, we've um, uh, resurveyed students who filled in the, the questionnaire we've been using to ask uh, about vaccinations um, uh, in the last few days. And that leads us to uh, a figure of 71, or at least 71% now second uh, vaccinated. Uh, and if you look at the age group figures we had for the 18 to 29 age group earlier in the city, it was 72% first jabbed, 62% double jabbed. Um, so we are, I, I think, pretty clearly headed towards 90% or so double vaccination rate um, during October. Uh, we've had vaccine clinics at the, the two universities um, this week. Uh, there's more at the weekend and, and we're working with Nimbus to make sure that we can um, offer the facility to students as the eight week gap ends for them and they, they're, they're eligible. Um, so it's a really, really positive uh, story. Uh, I guess there is a coda to that uh, for, for, for this group to, to think about, and that is if um, the student populations, and we're hearing very much the same from York St. John, the student populations are so highly vaccinated 
then uh, the, the much lower average rate for the age group suggests that those who are not university students are significantly um, you know, vaccinated significantly below that average uh, level, um, which um, is, is, I think, a challenge for us all to think about. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Charlie, uh, and I'm sure best of luck to, to you and also colleagues at, at York St John uh, at the start of both of your terms. And I wonder, um, Sharon, Steph or Mike, that, that final point that, that Charlie made uh, about data, whether it's something you have looked at or whether it's something that your, your teams will be looking at um, at the start of term. Uh, Steph. So I think the point that Charlie's making is is very well made and we're going to have to start thinking about um, whether our messages are hitting the non-university student and uh, if, if, if those because we don't differentiate is quite right we take the average uh, well it's not the average it's the total but if actually university students are up at 91 percent it's not unreasonable to think that uh, you know, we could be anywhere between 50 and 50 and 60 in the in the general city population and beyond. So, yeah, again, it comes comes back to um, that targeting and, and accessibility. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, thanks for that, Charlie. They're really interesting statistics. And, and um, I think what might be interesting, I mean, we have, there has been sort of pop-ups around the city and I know that community pharmacy have now been commissioned to do vaccinations in some of the areas where we know our younger population live. I think what will be interesting to see is what percentage of the total the university students make in that 18 to 29, so we can get a, a better idea of how far behind the, the general population is. And, and then I guess we can have a, a discussion about what we need to do to try and catch that up. Um, but yeah, thanks for raising that. That, that's great. If that's an action we could sort of take out, outside of the meeting, that, that would be great. Uh, Sharon. Yes, I was just going to ask Fiona really whether um, we would be able to, um, through the population health hub or, or the JSNA, be able to do some work to separate out the students from the rest of the population. I don't know how easy that would be using our population level data. I don't know whether you've got any insights into that, Fiona. I, yeah, I, I, it's certainly something we can definitely look at, but um, I, I think in terms of the data that we have access to, it, it is just, you know, you don't get any sort of occupation or, or level data about whether people are in full-time education. Um, but, you know, obviously the survey data that um, Charlie's collected might be really helpful in just doing some almost like proxy level estimates. If we know that this is the population that we've got in York, just doing some um, kind of looking at, well, if that proportion of students are vaccinated, what does that mean in terms of who else is left in that age range across the city? So, so yes, yeah, so it may not be exact, but it may be able to sort of give some estimates on that. So yeah, we can take that way to look at. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, just really quickly, I mean, um, I was just going to, obviously, we've been doing the clinics at the university just over the last couple of days, and I wonder whether the the, the people we've vaccinated over the, over those days have actually made it into the data that we've presented already tonight. So it, it will be interesting to see if those numbers affect the total figures and the percentages. Um, but clearly there's a piece of work to do here, Charlie, and, 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 and clearly it's going to happen. So thank you. Thanks for that. James. <clears throat> you, you were doing some really interesting work probably about a year ago now about behavioural insights which was understanding, you know, why people are making the decision to do and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I just wonder that's relevant here, but both to the bit I, we were talking about earlier around the messaging, but also with regard to this, with regard to why people are or aren't getting vaccinated. And uh, I just wondered whether that work was still ongoing and if we could kind of tap into it to understand some of the behaviours a little bit better. Thank you very much. I could see in the chat bar that we will be able to see, but those watching the meeting um, won't be able to see that. Gareth, who I'll bring in in a second, made a point that the, the council will work with Nimbus and partners 
to cross reference with that insight and the regional campaign that was mentioned in the in the communications presentation but I don't know Gareth if there's anything you want to, to add to that I, c I can see you, your lips moving but I can't hear sorry double muted um the um the the, the campaign that I was referencing earlier is being run by Behavioural Insight Agency, so that the insight they've got is much more relevant to now and and barriers to to the groups of people who haven't uh, who aren't getting vaccinated now. And there is a focus on that um, that younger age group within their work. So that's the data that I think we're going to have to use now, uh, and and the and the assets that come out of that uh, out of their pilots that they are. You know, I spoke to someone; they were on a photo shoot in Hare Hills in Leeds today, so they are actually getting on with it. It is a campaign that's very much of now. So um, we can we can share that data with partners, and um, um, I'll bring a report back on that to the next um, if you if you please. You. Yes, please. That'd be great. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Um, rather unscientifically, um, I, I think there are two behavioural insights that, that I can offer, um, having observed uh, what, what our students are doing and talked with uh, in, increasing amounts of them in, in person. Um, one is that we uh, we have a, a, a particular community setting um, in which messages about uh, social responsibility might have uh, more traction uh, than in in a, in a more diffuse setting. So we have an institutional setting in which those messages, are, I think, um, have have some power. Uh, the other thing, which is more general, um, is that I, I'm absolutely sure. Um, students have been enthusiastic uh, uptakers of vaccines so that they can have fun, uh, so that they, they have um, protection against the possible introduction of, of vaccine passports to go to, I don't know, football matches, nightclubs, what, whatever it is. Uh, and, and that really should be a more general prompt for uh, vaccine uptake because it's not just students who like to go to football matches or, or to nightclubs. Um, so um, I, I think that those two things are the big drivers that I, I have seen uh, and one of them should be a big driver for uh, the age group more generally. Thank you very much for, for that. So we're noting the, the update and obviously we've got an action there that will be carried through outside of the meeting. Um, the next agenda item, uh, number nine, is for items on the next uh, agenda. So please do uh, contact us if you uh, have any agenda items uh, for future meetings. And for the next meeting, which is in November, we have our standard items uh, and we already have an additional item um, in that we requested a further report on the economy and building back fairer, um, which James with uh, Simon Berriton from the council uh, will, will bring to us. But if there's anything in addition to that, obviously you can get in to, uh, into touch. Um, Item 10 on the agenda is dates for future meetings. So as I've mentioned, um, the next meeting is on the 24th of, of November uh, 21. You will remember that at our last meeting, we talked about uh, changing the pattern of meetings slightly um, to become uh, every two months. Uh, and I just wanted to give board members an opportunity uh, to say uh, if they were not happy with that. And if you are content, what that would mean is that we would have meetings on the 24th of November, then the 26th of January, the 23rd of March and the 25th of May. And, and obviously all the arrangements would be made to make sure they go into your diary and any meetings now not needed would come out of your diary. And the one thing that we did say though, was clearly if the situation changes and um, we would just add an extra meeting in um, like we've done in the past, if, if any of you think that is, is needed. So I'll just wait a couple of seconds now um, in case anybody uh, did want to say something or they're not happy with that new pattern uh, moving forward. If, if not, we'll take that as, as, as the board's agreement and get the correct invites out to everybody. Um, and then agenda item 11 is any other business. I'm not aware of any. So again, I'll just wait a couple of seconds uh, in case there are. I can see some nod, nods of the head uh, or shakes of the head rather. Um, 
but if not thank you all for your time today for all of those reports all of the work that goes on behind those reports uh, and the questions that you've uh, asked one final item i'd just like to mention is i know this is amanda's uh, last meeting of this uh, board as, as as sadly i'm sure you'll be taking part in the equivalent in in edinburgh um just to to thank you from all of us uh, for your work across uh, children's and, and adult social care particularly during the pandemic, which I don't imagine you will have thought about when you started at, at York three years ago. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're very welcome to say something, but we'll minute obviously our, our thanks to you. Just thanks for saying thanks. And um, one of the things that really has struck me, because I never did think I would be managing across a pandemic, because none of us ever did, has been how fabulous the partnership working's been in York. And, and I think we, you know, we had strong partnerships before, but we're even stronger now coming out the other side of hopefully coming out the other side of it. And, and I hope I get similar kind of positive partnership relationships when I go north of the border. But thank you everybody. very much. I'm sure Charlie, having come the other way, will be able to give you some advice as, as, as well. And um, so thank you all. Nice to see you all. And we'll see you all at our next meeting in November. Thanks. Bye bye. Joseph, is that is that all okay? If you stop recording us, we all would drop yep. it off anyway. <laughs> stop recording when you said thanks uh, and goodbye. So yeah, that's all done now, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Fantastic, thanks yes. all. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.